Newton's laws of motion. So his first law is uh, not really his idea. It was Galileo's idea. It's about inertia. But it was so important to motion, to get, to understand motion, it's so important that Newton decided he would restate what Galileo's observation and ideas on inertia in his first law, because that was, that's the foundation. If you don't have that, you can't build on it. In fact, for almost 2,000 years, not much happened in the world of physics because we weren't thinking about things properly. It's hard to get past friction and air resistance, and so people thought that they had, they had uh, that things would come to rest, right? You get something moving, and it wants to come to rest, because that's what happens. You push on something, and it, it comes to rest because of friction and air resistance. So if you don't understand the basics, if you can't get past friction and air resistance, and you don't understand the basics, then your foundation's not right. You can't build on that. So for almost 2,000 years, not much happened. And then in the 1500s, Galileo came along and said, no, that's not right. He, he did some experiments, and he decided that uh, uh, things, once they get moving, they want to stay moving. It's only a force that causes them to stop. And when they're stationary, when they're at rest, they want to stay at rest. They really want to remain in their state of motion. And that's what inertia is. It's this property that things have to resist changes in motion. If they're at rest, they want to remain at rest. If they're moving, they want to continue moving in a straight line at constant speed forever. And so we can sort of show that with this, uh, with this air toy. So by hovering on air, there's very low friction. And our table must not be quite level because it wants to go off in this direction. But if we give it a little push, we can get it to move. Oops. And it's going to move at constant speed in a straight line forever as long as air and friction don't act on it. Oops, it hit my book. I think you can kind of get an idea about that. When things act on it, when forces act on it, its motion can change. It can slow down, speed up, the direction can change. So this idea of inertia is that things have this propensity to remain in their state of motion. If they're at rest, they want to remain at rest. If they're moving, they want to continue moving in a straight line forever. And how do we measure that? Mass. Mass is the quantitative measurement of inertia. So the more massive something is, the more inertia it has. OK. Uh, so that brings us to a classic physics demonstration. Maybe you've seen this before. <clears throat> The tablecloth demonstration. Got our tablecloth here. My tablecloth has seen better days. And uh, some, some object with mass that has some inertia. And we can uh, put that on our, on our tablecloth. And uh, I'll give my tablecloth a, a quick tug. And what's going to happen to our block. <laughs> it's got some inertia. It's got some mass. It's going to resist that change in motion. That's sort of a conceptual way of thinking about it. And so, uh, so the tablecloth can slide out from underneath it. Shall we see what happens? You ready? Three, two, one. <clears throat> So the tablecloth basically came out from underneath it. What's really happening is, uh, we'll talk about it next when we get to Newton's second law, but uh, 
the forces between the block and the tablecloth were not big enough to get it to accelerate at the same rate as the tablecloth. So the block usually moves a little bit, but nowhere near as much as the tablecloth. But a sort of a conceptual way to think about it is that the uh, inertia of the block resisted that change in motion. All right, this is something you can do at home for your little brothers and sisters or your roommates, right? You can entertain them, get a textbook and a pillowcase or something, dish towel. But I'm a professional. You expect a little bit more out of me, right? So let's, let's see if we can up, the, up this a little bit. We'll get a plate. Okay. And uh, a glass. How's that? Better? Okay. We good? One, two, three. Okay, there you go. Uh, inertia, first law of motion, because it's so important, you had to start with that. Okay, second law. Second law links net force to acceleration. Most of us know it this way. F equals MA, the sum of the forces is equal to mass times acceleration. That's actually a vector equation. What it says is that there's actually a, a better way to write it. I think it's a little more intuitive is that the acceleration is equal to the net force over the mass. So what we really care about is acceleration. What causes acceleration? Force. The bigger the force, the more the acceleration. But what happens if our object is more massive? Right? A more massive object requires a bigger force to have the same acceleration as a less massive object. Okay? So that's where, that's where it kind of ties in with, uh, with pulling the, the tablecloth out from underneath the plate. There's what's the force acting on the plate? There's a force of friction, right, between the plate and the, and the tablecloth. But that force of friction is small compared to the mass of the glass and the plate. And so the acceleration that they produce is relatively small. The tablecloth was being accelerated at a big rate. I was really yanking it out quickly, right? There was a big acceleration there. So the acceleration on the objects on top of the tablecloth was much smaller than the acceleration of the tablecloth. So they, did they move a little bit? Yes, there was absolutely a force on those objects in that direction. They moved a little bit, but the acceleration was very small compared to the tablecloth. The motion with respect to the tablecloth was not much, right? So that's, that's the more technical way of viewing this. But if you want to just think about it, the inertia, that's okay too. And the third law. We've talked about that. That's uh, these Newton's pairs, right? Some people call it action, reaction. But when two objects interact with each other, they always interact with equal and opposite forces. So object A pushes on object B, object B pushes back on object A with an equal force in the opposite direction. Okay, just six more laws and we'll be done with motion. No, we're done now. Three laws, Newton's first law, second law, third law. Newton wasn't done though, Newton does a lot of things in physics. We'll get to Newton's law of gravity before this quarter's over. Newton also uh, uh, invented calculus so he could solve his physics problems. Or maybe he did that just to make your lives miserable. One, one or the other, I can't remember. 
And then he, uh, he did a lot of work with light also, separating light into its component colors and looking at interference patterns in light, things like that. He was, he was a busy guy. All right, so uh, inertia, F equals MA, or uh, force is, uh, is a net force over mass, however you like to think about that. And what is mass? Mass is inertia. So it's this inertia is this resistance to change in motion. Change in motion is acceleration. So it kind of makes sense that you'd have those in that, in that equation there. I know what I want. While we're talking about inertia, uh, this is one, one of those things that we have a lot of experience with, right? And so uh, the, maybe the most obvious example, you're driving in your car, your backpack is on the seat next to you, you hit the brakes because uh, something pops out in the road in front of you, and what happens to your backpack? It keeps going, right? It slides off the seat onto the floor because it has inertia. It's moving in a, in a straight line, and it wants to keep moving in that path forever until a force acts on it. And so it, it keeps going until something stops it from going. Uh, the same thing is true of you, right? You have inertia, and if you're, something stops your car suddenly, what do you want to do? You want to, your body wants to keep going and, until something acts on it. You don't want the thing to act on you to be the windshield of the car. <laughs> So you wear your seatbelt, right? We have, uh, and it, it holds you in, in to the car, and then there are other methods of dissipating that energy we'll talk about later on with airbags and padded dashboards and things like that, but that's, uh, that's another topic. And then uh, some of the more obvious ones too, what happens to when you're trying to get the, uh, the ketchup out of the bottle? Last little bit of ketchup. What do you do? You get the bottle moving really quickly, and then you stop it, you, and the ketchup at the bottom of the bottle has inertia, and it keeps going, and it ends up at the top of the bottle, and you squeeze it out, right? You gotta, if, you, if you can't use this stuff for your advantage in your everyday life, what good is it? And then one more example. Uh, pretend you've got, or maybe just grab a couple of things you've got in front of you, a calculator and a notebook or something. Two things that are roughly the same weight. Maybe a wallet and a cell phone. Hold them in your hands like this. And tell me which one is heavier. What you got? Get, get out, just grab two things, hold them in your hands like this, and then see if you can tell which one is heavier. You know what I see? I see a lot of people doing this. Why are you doing that? Because you, your hands are not sensitive enough to tell the weight of the difference between two objects that are relatively close in weight. But you know something about inertia, right? You know the more massive one is going to resist changes in motion more. And so if you shake them, you're going to be able to sense that, that weight, right, that inertia resisting the changes in motion. You'll be able to sense that much easier than you could just tell which one's heavier by holding them in your hands, right? You shake them a little bit you know about inertia.